Hello and welcome to this, the third talk in our series Snapshots of Faith, in which we are looking at notable figures in the modern history of Christian mission. In the last talk, we surveyed the remarkable life of William Carey. In passing, we noted that Carey in his spare time was a keen botanist and gardener. In today's talk, we turn our attention to someone for whom gardening was not just a hobby, but a profession, and it was a vacation that he placed at the very heart of his work for God as a missionary in southern Africa. Even after becoming a missionary, Robert Moffat gardened for the gospel. Part of the interest that Moffat holds for those of us viewing this video from the Dunfermline area is that for about a year as a young man, he lived just down the road in Dalgetty Bay and had family connections in Inverkeeving. He was born in Ormiston, East Lothian, on the 21st of December 1795 into a Presbyterian family. The family moved to Port Soy near Banff and then to Carronshaw near Falkirk, where Robert, from the age of 14, learned his apprenticeship as a gardener at Park Hill House, Polmont. In 1811, his father was appointed to the post of His Majesty's Deputy Collector and Principal Coast Officer at Inverkeeving, and the family took up residence in what is now known as Moffat Cottage. Robert served out his apprenticeship at Polmont until in 1812 he was appointed to his first job, working in the gardens of one of the grandest men in Scotland, the Earl of Moray, at Donny Bristle House at Dalgetty Bay on the shores of the Firth of Forth. With seven other employees, he lived in a boffy on the estate, which must have been rather a squash. Doubtless on his days off, he walked to Inverkeeving to see his parents. You can't see much of the gardens today, owing to the posh housing estate that now occupies this site. Though the Mori family's mortuary chapel, Donny Bristle Chapel, and two wings of the original house at Dalgetty Bay, still survive. Early in 1813, Robert moved to a new post in the nursery gardens of an estate at High Lee in Cheshire. They survive today as a garden centre. It was at High Lee that he found a personal faith in Christ through contact with a group of Methodists. While at Highley, he also came into contact with the minister of one of Manchester's leading congregational chapels, William Roby. Roby was a founding member of the London Missionary Society, LMS, and a great encourager and trainer of candidates for missionary service. Roby took the young gardener under his wing and secured him a new job at Duckenfield, Manchester, situated nearer to his home so that Moffat could benefit from his tuition in theology and help prepare him his application for service with the LMS. At Duck and Field, Moffat served in a nursery garden as undergardener to James Smith. Smith and his wife were both committed evangelicals and missionary enthusiasts. Their eldest daughter Mary would become Moffat's wife though they did not marry until after she followed Moffat as a missionary to South Africa in 1819. The Moffats were appointed by the LMS to its station at Litico, among one of the nomadic Swana peoples who inhabited the parched lands to the north of the Orange River, in what is now the Northern Cape province of South Africa. Litico was situated close to the Kuruman River, about 10 miles from its source, 
the eye of Kuruma, a spring from which some five million gallons of water a day gushed forth to flow northwestwards towards the Kalahari Desert. Sadly, the watercourse frequently disappeared into the light sandy soil, even before it reached Litako. Our present situation, wrote Robert to his elder brother Alexander in Invikiving in 1822, is miserable. Daily irrigation is requisite to procure a very scanty supply of vegetables, which has failed us this year. The missionaries had constructed a ditch to divert what intermittent water there was to water their own gardens. Irrigation was a technique hitherto unknown to the Tswana people, but their women soon got the idea and began cutting trenches to divert the missionaries' water into their own gardens. Moffat and the existing missionary, Robert Hamilton, had to take turns in going out with a spade sometimes under cover at night, to reverse the flow in the direction of their houses. But this game of horticultural tit-for-tat went on indefinitely. The water supply was frequently so curtailed that poor Mary Moffat had to dispatch the bed linen on a journey of a hundred miles to be washed. Furthermore, what vegetables they did manage to grow were liable to be trampled underfoot by the oxen or stolen by the locals. This depressing horticultural harvest was exceeded by the entire absence of a spiritual one. The people continued indifferent to the gospel. In response to these frustrations, the Moffats moved their station eight miles to a new site close to the eye of Kuruman itself, where there was fertile ground and a guaranteed supply of water. Work began on the construction of a dam and irrigation canal two miles long, which would supply the locals' homes and gardens. The missionaries did most of the construction work themselves, often in daytime temperatures as high as 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The irrigation scheme soon began to benefit the whole community. By December 1827, Mary Moffat, writing to her brother in Manchester, was able to tell him that the local people were reaping good crops in their own gardens. The fruit which is ripening is very abundant, she reported, I am astonished to see what the willing earth yields in so short a time. But Swana proved eager to adopt the new crops that Moffat had introduced. Maize, wheat, barley, bees, potatoes, carrots and onions. While the men, who traditionally would never have deigned to be seen doing the women's work of digging the gardens, now became keen to obtain their own ploughs arrows and spades. The message that men ought not to leave the gardening entirely to their wives was beginning to sink in. In 1834, Moffat reported to the LMS that Kuruman had become like Goshen in the story of Joseph, a biblical storehouse of plenty set in a dry and thirsty land. However, it took some time for the abundant agricultural produce of Kuruman to be paralleled by spiritual growth. The first candidate for baptism was a former runaway slave named Arendt, who, with his three children and the Moffat's own son Robert, was baptised on the 1st of May 1829. The baptismal service was marked by an outpouring of weeping among the women, children, and most unusually for Botswana, even men. Moffat described this event as a revival, in which we were favoured with a manifest outpouring of the Spirit from on high. The moral wilderness was now about to blossom, he said. 
the simple gospel has melted their flinty hearts. Late night and early morning prayer meetings were organised in homes, and soon there were six more candidates for baptism. Arendt was a builder and thatcher, and erected a building that would serve as schoolhouse and chapel. On the first Sunday in July 1829, the six, who included Aaron's wife, were baptised in the new chapel. Moffat felt that the long-awaited spiritual harvest for which he had prayed was now ripening to fruition. He cited Psalm 126, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Other encouragements followed. From the early 1830s, portions of scripture became available in the Setswana language, and enthusiasm for reading soon generated enthusiasm for the Christian message itself. By 1838, Moffat was able to report great accessions to the number of believers. In July 1844, a young missionary recruit, also from Scotland, screwed up his courage standing under, under one of the fruit trees of Kuruman and asked for Moffat's eldest daughter Mary to marry him. She said yes. His name was David Livingstone. Livingston would go on to become perhaps the best-known missionary in Victorian Britain, although the story of his marriage to Mary Moffat is not entirely a happy one. Robert and Mary Moffat Sr. remained at Kuruman until their retirement in 1870. The life of Robert Moffat supplies us with a model of what it means to dedicate one's passion in life and one's vocation to the cause of the gospel. His green fingers were devoted to God and enabled the Tswana people to enjoy a richer and more sustainable lifestyle in their arid environment, as well as the gift of new life in Christ. But there is rather more to be said. Moffat loved to draw analogies between the horticultural harvest at Kuruman, and the spiritual one that eventually came. There is good biblical precedent for that. The Bible begins with a garden, and ends with a garden city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. God cares enough about the natural world he has created to make it the prototype, the raw material, for that new earth that will come about at the end of time, when he will be perfectly present in the midst of his redeemed people. If the created world matters so much to God, so it should to us. And maybe those of us with green fingers have a particular role to play as stewards in preparing this created world for the new transformed creation which God will bring about at the end of time.